Well, well thank you very much for that, Rich. And uh, again, good to see you again. <clears throat> uh, welcome everybody. Uh, what Rich talked about was uh, all true. Uh, the Versada product, for example, um, would have cost you around $25,000 per CPU. As he mentioned very quickly, it's now open source. Uh, it's based on Python. So uh, the, price is, the price is right. Um, my background way before I met Rich was perhaps a lot like uh, many of you folks, where I did projects um, in, in a small company in DC. And the, the name of the game was delivering fast. If you could deliver very, very fast, uh, you could increase your margins. And, it, and in the limit, if, if, if fast became ultra fast, you could get more business because you could do demos and sort of prove to the customer that you knew what you were doing. So that, that's the background that, that led to this. It's, it's really not a technology play uh, from, from the sort of um, you know, intellectual perspective. It's really from the perspective of delivering projects just like I suspect you guys are doing. I, as, as Rich sort of mentioned, uh, the, the kinds of projects we're talking about are database apps, transactional database apps, uh, sometimes inter typically interactive, sometimes message-based, sometimes both. Uh, so and that's what we're gonna talk about. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at a project in GitHub that is the sample app of API Logic Server. Uh, it's the sample app augmented uh, to include something I was often asked about at Versada, which is what's the methodology? What's the process by which I develop things? And um, so you can download this. It has instructions on how to install it and so forth. I'll walk you through this. And as uh, we mentioned earlier, very much encouraging people to stop me and ask questions as things don't make sense because there's a, a lot of material to cover. I'm gonna leave out some details, but if I leave out too much, of course, it doesn't make any sense. So. Here, here's the bird's eye view of what we're gonna talk about. I'm, I'm not a devotee of Agile, but certainly at the level of the Agile manifesto, how can you argue with getting working software quickly to, to collaborate and get the requirements right, um, iterate, respond to change and so forth. I mean, that's, that's iterative development in, in, our, in a prior world. And that's kind of the world that, that I think works the best. Uh, that's my perspective. So this is API logic server over on the left and how do we do it? So I use the term extensible automation because, and, and I, I use the word extensible because automation scares people and I'm trying to relax them. Uh, meaning people think when they see automation, they're gonna get kablam, whatever it is. And if I, ch maybe I can't change it. And if I can, it's gonna be painful. Uh, on the contrary, this system is designed to be extensible. Uh, so it actually creates a project. I'll show you that in a second. And you know, if you're, if you're agile, you, you want this working software. Well, there's a problem. The, the, the piece of working software that I think engages business users the best is not database diagrams and it's not any kind of, di it's working screens. It, it's basically people, you know, business users are asleep until they see the screens and then they wake up and they give you all the things they forgot to tell you in the past six months. And that's the problem, right? If you've spent six months getting to the point where you really first show something to somebody and then they go, wait a minute, that's not, that's, that's not a pretty sight. So what if you could have, as, as Rich put it, working software instantly just by literally doing a command. So you start the collaboration uh, per Agile and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. You can do things like find out if the data model's wrong, whatever. But one of the nice things about that is what'll come out of it is, you know, these are live screens, these are not mockups. So you can make changes and that will provoke people to say, wait a minute, you didn't check this or you didn't compute that or you didn't do this business policy we've got. So what I'm showing here in step three is this collaboration, we'll show this, that's the whole point of the presentation, is to show how this collaboration can lead to rules, which are input to this automation engine, uh, which, which basically then allows you to iterate more collaboration, more changes and so forth. One of the things that comes out of all that obviously is a system, but also a report, I, I was, I'm calling it a TDD report, which lists all of your stories uh, and all the logic that made those stories work. And I'll, we'll, we'll show that in, in detail. TDD stands for Trust Driven Development. 
it's it's one of the agile methodologies to you know back in the day we used to say the system is the sum of the use cases we now say stories um so the the idea is that if you're going to develop these stories don't stop there include the tests uh, with the stories and then um the documentation becomes the 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 test plan so that's that's the idea of that and what i've done in this project is adopt the tdd methodology into use with api logic server um, so let's go through it so the database um, that we're going to look at it's it's basically northwind a lot of people are familiar with that that's the reason we chose it it's it's you know customers orders and items and parts and so forth pretty familiar database so this is a blow up of the, the diagram we just saw where the, the key steps are, I'm gonna use API logic server to produce the app. You can sort of see that hiding here, that's step one. Then we're gonna do some collaboration things uh, and then we're gonna do some development stuff. So we'll do a quick little demo here. I think most of this will just be looking at screens and yakking, uh, but you know, Rich said it's fast. So if it's actually, if it really is fast, we should be able to do it, right? So when Rich had um, used API logic server, the hardest part of any of these things, the, the thing that's always painful. What is the database connection string, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is the Rich Dan Keller Memorial uh, screen here. <laughs> so you got a memorial even though you're not dead, which is always a good, always a good plan. So here, here's several examples of how you run with, with these database connection strings. They're very painful. But there, that's a one-time thing, you could buy it. So what you do is you say create. And it says name my project. So let's say Canton. This is where you type in the database string, whatever it is. If you just press enter, it uses the default database. And what it just did is it built a project. Right? It built a full project. And I'm going to show you essentially they built this project. So if you've never used um, Vis Visual Studio uh, before, Visual Code before, uh, this is Microsoft Visual Code. It's, it's a wonderful little IDE. It's fast as blue blazes. And this is the project that it built. Um, I added, of course, several things to it. That's the customization or the extensibility part. Uh, but it, it knows about my database model. It's going to have logic in it. We'll talk about that. It's got a UI component. And I can run it. So this starts up the server. So this is the server we just built. So this is the app Rich was referring to. So these are all the tables in my database, customers and so forth. I can drill down on a customer. So it's a multi-page application. I can drill down on an order. It's, it's a non-trivial application. Uh, if you look at order details, that is the things in an order, um, they don't have the, the, um, the product name in it. Yet it does here. So what the system did is not only built a multi-table, multi-page application, but it did automatic joins because who wants to see a product ID when the product name is what makes any sense? So the point that we made in the beginning is now that you've got this app, this app is what feeds the collaboration process of TDD. Now users can say, wait a minute, customers, you have multiple addresses, you know, what, whatever you didn't quite understand to begin with, you can very quickly feed in. And as we just saw, the, the creation process is virtually instantaneous. So that iteration is not a matter of six months, find out bad news and then commit suicide. It's tweak your data model, rebuild and go. So that's the, that's the first piece. Val, can I just call out something to, to make sure everybody's aware of it? Val just built that app that fast. When he ran that, 
that heartbeat that it took for the terminal window to advance to the next line, that's how long it took to build the app. That's what's so amazing about this. And it's an app, not just that runs, but it's an app that's got a project behind it that you can customize in an IDE you're familiar with. So what used to take us years, took us, well, it took Val years, but it would take you 12 seconds. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Val. Okay. <laughs> you're quite welcome. So if we pick up our process, that just- Oh, crud. <laughs> Major crud. crud. Major crud, super crud. So we built this admin app and let me just make some positioning statements here. I don't have any um, illusions that that app, you can customize the app. You can change the captions and the names and the field layouts and stuff like that. But there's limits to that. It's all done with a YAML file in the background. I won't bother you by showing it. It's pretty trivial. My point is that um, there are definite limits on that customization. So I would position this as a back office. That's why we use the word admin app. The API that's underneath the app is what you could use for your custom apps. So what API? Along with this app, it produced the, this. So here's the swagger. So it built a complete API with get, put, post, and so forth for every table uh, that does pagination, um, filtering, sorting, and um, related data retrieval. That's a non-trivial API. So it's not so hard to build an API for one endpoint. Building an API for all of your tables with you know, pagination and sorting and filtering and related data access, that's not rocket science, but it takes you quite a long time. So that, so underneath this app is also the API. And again, that's what you can use to build the custom apps that you know, are kind of the, the, the front office apps uh, for your project. So at this point now we've, we've, got, an ad, we've got our admin app. Uh, we talked about revising the data model, that's pretty trivial. Let's talk about the, the other really big part. So what, what, one big part is this admin app and the API under it. The other the big, big part is this, this logic business. And so how do you get to the logic? Because there's, there's some serious magic in that. So again, the app itself, and this is what's nice about automation and, and agile is automation produces the application that drives the collaboration. So as, as your users, as you show the users the screens, they'll think of things like place order and they'll say, well, when bad order, it's got to reject credit. You, you, you might hear some, some words like that. So what you do now, well, I don't know what you do now, but what I used to do is write it down on, on an envelope or a notebook or something like that. So we can do a little better. So the, I mentioned earlier that this is built with a methodology called TDD, Test Driven Development. And uh, that's produced um, a fairly interesting following. And so therefore people uh, put together some automation around TDD to capture uh, the elements of TDD. And, one of the, and, and that's what you're seeing here. These things called features, scenarios, and givens. That's, that's how you document a story in TDD. So a feature place order, that's kind of self-explanatory. It's like a story. A scenario is a, think of it as a test run. So if we're placing orders, I got to worry about what happens with good orders and bad orders and what happens if I alter the order. That's what we're seeing here, right? And what the TDD means is I don't just state the feature, I state the tests specifically. Okay, so I, so this is really just text. That's really just text. Um, so let's let's zoom in on this. So we're saying placing order, blah, 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 when it works. Let's focus in on the, what does it mean that this, we have to reject it per the credit limit. What do you mean when you say, so you, the first thing you do is you capture what they said. That's in this TD, this framework is by the way called Behave. That's the name. It's, it's just a package you can install into your project as I've done here. 
Uh, so you capture this stuff and behave, and now you say, well, let's talk about credit, li credit, credit limit. What does it mean to check the credit limit? So now I'm in my IDE and here's our, I'm repeating our sort of um, TDD statement here. And I might just capture as text, this is a comment. I might just capture as text, the let's call it the logic specification of what they mean by check credit. Well, what do you mean by check credit? Well, it means that the balance has gotta be less than the credit limit. So I write that down. And then I do stepwise definition of terms. Well, what's the balance? That's the sum of the orders amount totals that are unshipped. So you see the chaining going on here, right? Well, what's the order total? What, what does that mean? Stepwise definition of terms. That's the sum of line item amounts. Okay, what's the line item amount? That's the price times the quantity. And here's, and, and the price is obtained from the product. So this would be in my terms, speaking as an ex developer, uh, a wonderful spec. Uh, I didn't dive into pseudocode and tell you how to do what you're doing. I told you what the end result has got to be. I, I gave you the, the what, not the how, right? So it's good spec. What would be- Just, out of, cur Go just ahead. out of curiosity, why is it unshipped and not shipped? Because uh, when, when we, we assume when we ship it, we've paid it. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So if it's unshipped, you, you owe us money. If it's shipped, you pay it. I wasn't expecting to actually get asked questions. So I, I had forgotten the answer to that. So I'm, I'm glad I was Thanks able Thanks for to, exposing an assumption. I'm glad I was able to make <laughs> one up on the spot there. It sounds convincing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it was also made up on the spot. So now we've got this very valuable documentation of our stories and our tests. We got more documentation. It's in a piece of Python code now, but it's still just a comment of our logic spec. So the, in the ideal world, I would just sort of pour this into the computer and we'd run. That, that would be perfect, right? If, if this, because if you think about this, I, I coded this as an example. Um, this is really a spec about the data, not about this use case. So this spec tells me not just what to do about rejecting an order. It tells me how to compute the balance for a good order. It tells me um, what to do when I ship the order to sort of reduce the balance. Uh, it tells me what to do if I change a line item quantity, I increase the amount that, that bubbles up. So I can spin about a dozen use cases that this specification addresses. And if I write the code for that, and I did, these five lines, you know, 56 through 60, these five lines of spec uh, result in about 280 lines of Python code, give or take. Is that, let's stop there. Does that surprise anybody? Does that sound about right? I mean, they might've been triggers, they might've been Python code, they might've been Java, but, boy, but basically by the time you do all the SQL, and the what changed and when I when this changes, update that. Does it sound right? That would be a couple hundred lines of code, give or yep. take. Okay, all right. And thirty libraries. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've all done that. And seventeen all, bugs. Say it again. Oh, I got a quick question. And seventeen Bob. bugs. Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> it's okay. Good. Okay, on lines fifty-five through sixty six six zero. Yeah. You have some stuff that clearly doesn't start with. Um, uh, reserved words in the Gherkin language, but these as a result, are... it's it's fair game. But it also looks like it's part of a uh, doc strings block. It is, it's, it's, and that's why I did it that way because you know the idea, you know, going way back of Java doc and you know Don Knuth, put your documentation in your code, and then you can extract it in a in a thing. So all I've done, this is not code. Uh, this is just comment in code, but as he points out, this is a doc string. Right, doc strings are really handy if you're actually going to say, and you get a letter that looks like this, and it's literally a multi-line string of ASCII. That's right, that's right. And we're gonna, we're gonna have a lot more fun with the doc strings in just a minute. Okay, thank you. Sure. So here's the big reveal. 
So this is this this is another <clears throat> excuse me similar screenshot. We've got our little behave documentation appears. Same thing we saw about you know bad credit whatever. Here's the comments we had. So this is our spec, and it turns out the spec is executable. If I'll give you a chance to read that while I'm blathering, but there's a one-to-one, -one, literally one-to-one -one correspondence between these lines of the spec and these rules. These are executable rules. Now, when I say executable rules, I mean, I type them in, I use code completion, just like you'd expect. And when I type them in, nothing happens. They're, they're, they're really just kind of logged. They become part of the code that's loaded in when the server starts. At that point, nothing happens. These rules only apply when transactions occur. So what happens is a rules engine, it's, it's watching transactions through the ORM, that's SQL Alchemy, very much like Hibernate or JPA if you're a Java person. And it's looking for, it's looking at the, the transaction that comes in to see if it's changed any of the data that these rules um, reference. And if so, it runs the rules. And those rules may change data and make more rules run. So the rules chain, just as we mentioned when we were uh, thinking about them intellectually. So for example, if we work from the bottom, when I insert the line items, this says, get the, uh, the I'm sorry, order detail, get the order details price from the product. So it does a SQL and does that. Well, since I've changed the unit price, that triggers this rule because it references unit price. So it recomputes the amount. Well, amount is referenced in this rule in a different table. So this, this change triggers this rule. The amount triggers is referenced by the customer's balance. That triggers this rule. So it's multi-table chaining. Now, you might expect reasonably that, you know, you look at this, you know, hmm, I see what you're doing. This is just alternative SQL select sum of syntax, right? It's not. This is a declarative way of, of specifying logic. And declarative is a very, very strong word. It's like, you know, bold and, ita well, here it is, bold and italic, right? <laughs> it, it, it means that uh, we order it and we determine when to run it. These are things that are not true of code, right? In code, you order it and you determine when to run it. You call it or, or you forget to call it. That's a bug, right? But not only that, you're just giving us the end conditions. These are not executable statements like a SQL select statement. They're end conditions, which must be true at the end of the transaction. That gives us the opportunity to, to optimize these. As long as we come up with the right answer, we can do whatever we want. So in fact, imagine, let's just take uh, one particular example. Imagine a customer had a thousand orders and we, we increase the amount of one uh, of, of the orders and we wanna make sure the balance is still okay. What you really don't want is to add up a thousand orders to determine the new balance and check that against the credit limit. Instead, if the order total changed from 100 to 120, that's a difference of 20, add 20 to the balance and check it, which is what it does. So it's really taking the intent and saying, okay, I see what you want to do. I'll figure out how to do it and I'll optimize it for you. So the system undertakes the responsibility, not just to execute your logic, but to optimize it. Okay, so this happens, again, it's, it's connected to the ORM, which is what the API is connected to. So this happens whether you're doing a service or whether you're doing UI or just writing code. As long as you use the ORM, these rules will kick in and execute. Now, when they do that, so imagine yourself using this. And so you, you do this transaction rules and the rules go thumbs up, good job. Well, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but we really need to know that it really did work. I mean, we, we need to see what it did. Maybe it didn't get the right answer, right? So these rules, when they run, produce a log. 
you know, I forgot to have a screenshot of that. Here it is. Just a little peek of it. When these rules, so when I, getting back to our tests, when I run a test, um, it, runs the, it runs the transaction, which runs the rules. This business here is what I'm calling a logic log. That's a record of each rule that ran when this transaction ran. And what each line is, is a rule that's running, like the copy rule, the amount rule, whatever. And the rest of the row is the values of the, is the, values of the, of the columns. So I can see exactly what each rule did to the row. And furthermore, how the, how the transaction jumps tables. Here's where it, the change to the order detail table affected the product and affected the customer. Okay, so this is very, very valuable information. So now we've got something pretty interesting. So we've got a listing of, um, of our use cases, I'm sorry, stories and scenarios. And once I've done this, so let me reset you a little bit. Once I type this into behave, that's behave up here. Behave has the ability to say, run it. So it turns out this is not just documentation. This is my test suite. So I can run my test suite just by saying behave, go, right? And when that happens, so we, when that happens, behave, this is behave, I say behave, go. Behave will produce a log that tells me uh, every transaction in my test suite and whether it passed or not. And as it's running, this, this logic over here, these rules are producing this logic log. So this is pretty interesting, right? We've, we've got some really valuable information here. We've got a record of all of our use cases and stories and whether they passed or not. And this log information is useful for programmers, but it's not, it's, it's, but we could make this a lot better. This is, this is an action. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So when it runs, is it, is it making up data or does it real need real data? Or it needs real data. It needs yeah. real data. Okay. And where does it get that real data from? Does and it... and it, remember that you, that ugly, you know, Rich Dam Keller Memorial thing. So that was your database. It's in your okay. database. Okay. 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 This particular, you know, system, uh, you don't have to install a database to run it. Uh, it comes with a SQLite database, which is just in in uh, in the project, uh, so you can sort of run without installing stuff. Okay, thank you. So but now, it, please. But it might be interesting to talk about what databases this works with. Yeah, um, it, it basically the. the the conceptual answer is it runs with anything SQL Alchemy runs with. That includes most of the database you've ever heard of. Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle, um, MySQL, SQLite, and so forth. We've tested it with, and I thought I had this up. So, even if you don't use this product, um, you might like this. So th these are our test databases. So you can see you know, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, and so forth. But each of them, we provide you a Docker for it. So there's a whole bunch of Docker databases out there. If you want a quick start of a, a simple little database to fiddle around with, Knock yourself out. Okay, so we're on the verge of something pretty cool. Uh, we, we've got this system producing a nice sort of test report. This is a little less interesting, but it, it could be interesting. These rules up here, they were kind of, they were very interesting because not only, so again, these five rules, the sort of the headline story is these five rules replacing 280 lines of code. That's a 40 to one ratio, right? So you're, you're looking to get a 40 to one reduction in your backend code. 
a significant part, maybe half, not quite half of your system. That's a big deal. Not only that, they're very concise and they're optimized, but they're also kind of business user readable. I mean, they're close, right? I don't think I'd want business users writing these, but I certainly can imagine using this as collaboration. Oh, wait a minute. You didn't include the tax in the order total, right? A business user could read, it's kind of like a spreadsheet. That's how I often describe these rules. They work like a spreadsheet. Business users are certainly familiar with spreadsheets. So certainly they, they, they have a lot of sort of transparency. That's an opportunity. So the last step, sorry to hurt your eyeballs here. So what we've done is we've captured our feature. We did some logic specification. That logic specification turned out to be essentially the rule. So we entered the rules in our IDE. We defined our test case in our IDE, that's code. So there's nothing magic about that. You gotta write the code that says, do the transaction, make sure the balance is this and the you know, blah, blah, blah. But step four, TDD report. That's kind of interesting. What's that? Tacked on it into this readme and you've got this, um, is our TDD, TDD report. So here's, here's our bad order, right? And it passed. So this is very useful. You got a nice, now wiki, wikified a version of, of your test logs. But more than that, I can click this, I can go into sort of ultra collaboration mode. What this will do is actually go into the logic log and extract the information for that particular scenario, that test, and show here's all the rules that ran in this test. Not all the rules in your repository, just the rules that actually fired that governed this transaction. These are the, so we talked about collaborating with business users. Business users can now read these rules and say, well, where's your tax rule, right? And if there's questions about how it worked, this is a little more um, technical detail. This is that logic log with the nesting and, and the, the view of the, of the transactions. And this is literally produced by running the test. So the process looks a little like this. I just want, while you're doing that, I want to call out, that's fantastic. Because when you have to debug, when a test fails, there's that's the arrow problem. pointing at your problem is here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I don't know how many people have used Visual Studio Code. It's, it's a really wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. So what's going on here is it started up the server. This is where the logic log kind of will wind up being. Down here, um, these are all my, what's called launch configurations. Launch configurations just says, here's a program I wanna run, and here's the arguments and the outputs and blah, 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 so I can just click and run it. So I can run my test like this. So I just ran the test. And I can look at the log. So my tests are under here. So this is the log that the test just produced. It's not the, the wiki, but it's the test that I just ran. Happily, they all ran. And the crowd says, ooh, ah. Mm. Let's add some sound effects. That's cool. So here, by the way, are the, the features that we, we talked about. This is the place order feature. That's this. It's really just a glorified text file with you know, some keywords in it. And then I implement the actual tests as these thing called steps. And that's just regular old Python code. Nothing fancy about that. So I look so, at my test. Go ahead, Rich. So where do these, where do these tests uh, come from? They, you wrote this or did I, this I wrote generated? These. I wrote these. Okay. I, no, no, these are not generated. These are, so the, the, the dance of behave is you, you code your,
you, you design your feature and tests, and then you write these tests. And the way you link them together is this, this annotation here matches some text over here. Right? This, this can get a little tedious. There's, writing tests is no fun and you got to do it. I mean, otherwise, how do you know the system runs? I mean, <laughs> trust, trust me, it runs fine. That's probably a good point for the question I've been having for a while that you've been answering for a while is I'm liking the declarative nature of some of this. And I want to make sure that this isn't just a circular argument for its multiple ways to say the same thing. Therefore, it's not really testing anything. It's my fear. So if, if you're declaring something, it seems like that's creating the CRUD and some ORM and some GUI. And how do you make sure that all this automated stuff that's generated is, and I think you just answered it. Yeah, that's but exactly how, right. How, like, do you, how do you make sure that it's not just a, a self-referential proof that it, it it's self-consistent? I feel fine. <laughs> I feel fine. Trust yeah, me. I, I don't fine. know how to, but you get what I'm pointing at, even though my English isn't great. No, but I, I, you're exactly right. And, and it's as simple as, you know, it's simple. It's as, it's a, it's a blunt force as you might imagine. You know, the, in these tests, I sort of, I give myself some JSON, I post a transaction and I check the results. You know, now I'll peek at the logic log and see, you know, do I think that's the right answer and so forth. But basically this test, you're exactly right. This, this test does not take on faith that the rules will work. This test is designed to prove that the rules worked as you hoped they did. So question, so in the beginning of the talk, you generated uh, a project. So what did you get in that generation? And what do you mean that you hand wrote this, this, this test? Okay. Did, did so, you have? No, that's a very good question. And I, I tried to make that clear and thank you for, for calling me to task on that. So what I got, in fact, yeah, I'll, let me just tell you um, what I got for free in the generation, as you put it, so I got the project, which included the admin app, um, the API, and the data model under it. What is the data model under it? This is more than you asked, but it, in, in the real world, you need to know this. So if you use Hibernate and stuff like that, um, you have to have these classes that correspond to your tables. Mm -hmm. So it generated that for you, which is very much appreciated. That's, that's very, very handy. We do not generate your rules for you. How could we, right? We don't generate your tests for you. All that's in your head. In fact, it's not in your head, it's in your user's head. And that's kind of the point of the talk is to show you a, as pain as painless of a way as possible of getting that information out of the user's head into the computer right did i answer yes. your question yes thank you and and the, the point and you build these rules and these tests so, in your ide it's not some weirdo you know pinko communist plot it's it's uh -oh. <laughs> your, your basic standard you know ide with code completion debuggers all the stuff you need and expect. So, so in a scenario so, where you're setting something up for a customer and you're trying to like uh, collaborate of what th what their needs really are, you would have to set you know take their initial requirements or whatever they give you and then set this up and then go see it with the you know, you would hand write those rules and tests and show it to them. But then how how easy it is to kind of adjust this on the fly and change and show the kind oh the customer says no no we want this okay that's yeah. a very good question so so this is documenting the sort of the outer level of the, the stories and, and the tests this is the next level down and now now you input the rules mm -hmm. and they go yeah you know the tax thing right <laughs> so there's some key elements of rules so th this code this, this is code, it's declarative code, but it's code, is input in any order you want. Because the rules actually 
parse the dependencies of these, the engine parses the dependencies of these and computes an, an execution order. What that means is when you find out you're missing a rule, the rule's wrong or whatever, you just come in and change the rule and run. Mm -hmm. And the system rebuilds the dependency graph in the execution order and the optimization plan automatically. This is analogous to what happens when you add an index to a relational database. You run the same queries, but they now run faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thanks. Let's see if I can wrap that around my, my so the declarative stuff is creating some runtime crud. I'm sorry, some, some like compile time crud, but it's also rules no, for the runtime not, declarative it's not, engine. It's a runtime declarative engine, right? The runtime declarative engine is reading these, these rules that you loaded in, it's parsing them and remembering them in its little bag of rules. And then when transactions come in, it looks at the bag of rules and says, okay, these rules apply and these rules don't. So it prunes the rules that don't okay. and runs the rules that do. And what declarations create the API or the GUI? Is that a different set of declarations? Yeah, let me show you. Because I think I'm figuring out what's declarative up front and what's kind of functional later on in that brain spit from my previous question. So this is what drives the GUI. This is generated from the data model. So this says this is a screen. Here's the attributes. Right. So the what data model happen? drives the data model drives the GUI and these other okay. rules. Okay. That's right. That's right. And it's, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to write this, but if I want to change the order of the of the fields, it's just cut, you know, copy paste and you know add a caption. So this is easy to edit and you don't have to write it because it's generated from the data model. But importantly, the, the UI does not talk directly to the database, right? Correct. It talks to the API, which is enforcing the rules. So if we pick up our thread, we've created a, created a, you know, created a project from a database that gave us the API and the UI. We elicited the, the logic design. We coded the rules. We coded the test. We ran the test by just running this this thing run behave logic. And now we run this last thing, run the report. And that produces this. Which is what you're looking at. So what this is doing, it it takes your readme and tacks on to the end of it the TDD report, which is the TDD log. With the, with the logic log injected into it, just what I showed you. So that's how you generate your project documentation from these declarative um, inputs. So you got this. I already pasted a question into the chat. Okay, Can I don't see that. I'll read it. You're, you read you're, it? Go already, ahead. do you want to, well, interrupt me already if you want. Otherwise, sure, your rules sure. are almost, Go ahead, sure. Okay, your rules are almost but not quite predicates. You seem to build tests based upon these not quite predicates, and then you're running these tests over what data? I'm. It's the it's the it's the SQLite database. So, so you're running it. So, so so you're running it over a a a little swath of well defined, for lack of a better term, uh, data. So you know it'll perform for that data. You don't know. You haven't. I mean, you haven't been able to establish that it will, um, um, you know, accept the the iffy but correct things and reject the iffy but incorrect things. It seems. It seems like there's you know, the same kind of hole that 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 ends up being created in, in, in a lot of. Of. Um, I'm not sure your question. It is certainly the case that I created this database with normal SQL tools, that it's SQLite is simply to make your install easier. 
what I then did is I entered in my test data, right? In, and I entered it so that I could test good orders and bad orders. I entered products, I entered, you know, all that stuff, right? In, in the same way, in the same way you do now, nothing different, right? This database is what the API runs against. So when I run the tests, the API is accessing this database and issuing transactions against this database. Right, no, no, I understand that. I understand that, but it's a case of it's, um, uh, when you're done and everything works, you only know that it's gonna work against the particular data that you happen to have in your database. That's true. And that's always the case, right? What else a, could it be? Uh, well, I mean, you've, you've, you've um, uh, you know, you, you haven't done anything generative. You haven't, you know, seen what any corners look like. You haven't seen where, um, you know, the nasty bits tend to live. Yes and no. I mean, certainly we, we, we haven't, we haven't generated the test cases from the, you, you can imagine maybe I can't, but I can a little bit imagine creating the test because we know what the rules are. We don't do that. So you have to create the tests and the test data to go with them. Um, however, one of the things that you find is remember what's applying these rules to the transactions is not your code, it's the rule engine. So even, you know, if, if you were to design, let's say, um, moving an order to, from customer one to customer two, you might forget that that adjusts the balance. You, you just might forget. The rules won't. So the rules will automatically be applied to every transaction. And they may realize there are things to do, compensatory changes, you know, chained updates to other data that you would have forgotten to do. Um, so you're going to get a level of quality. A level of quality is engineered in because the rules never forget. They they always run whatever transaction comes in because the rules are attached to the data, not to a particular service. When you write code, your code is attached to a given service or a button or whatever. And for other buttons or service, maybe that code runs, maybe it doesn't. In a in a declarative approach, that code is guaranteed to run. So it's not guaranteed to get the right answer, but it's guaranteed to run. If you gave it the wrong rule, it's gonna get the wrong answer. But we do guarantee that it runs in all relevant cases. Well, okay, that's an interesting thing what, what you're talking about the, so, so what you're saying is that um, uh, you're, guarantee, you're, you're guaranteeing that um, with whatever you do, the state of the data in the database will be consistent after your run. It'll be in, exactly a, in, a state, right. in a state that is consistent according to your rules. That's right. And if it's not, that's a, that's a, that's a bug on me. That's a huge statement, right? That, that, that takes a whole class of bugs out of, out, of, out of play, right? Where you forgot to call the code or the code sure, ran sure. the order. And that's a huge statement. So the, the conciseness is one piece, but the ability to sort of guarantee at least a certain level, not ultimate, but a certain level of quality is a very big deal. Not to mention the reordering, so that when I change the rules and revise them, the system will realize, oh, I better run this one before that one because they now depend on each other. That just happens. Thanks for the question. Can I just sort of go meta here? What I'm hearing is that you're partitioning when you think about something and where you put it in the code and who executes that with the generator or the inference engine. You're, you're finding different times to put that information into the system so that you get it out when you need to. It's what I'm hearing from a lot of the last couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, I may be confusing you a little bit and I apologize if I am by introducing the whole methodology bit into it. At the end of the day, you don't need the methodology bit. If, if you listen to your user and just type the rules in, that's fine. You, if you don't want to run tests, you don't want to run, you know, it's, it's, it's your little red wagon, right? Um, but, the, but the projects I've worked on, um, even in the Versada projects where there's a similar rule engine, um, you still have to answer the question that your customer says, is the system ready to go live? I don't know how you answer that question unless you've got a test suite, right? So I'm trying to show you how to develop 
a test suite and have that drive your design and rules implementation as one continuous process, which I think is a big deal. We didn't have that in Versailles. Big deal. And people, people struggle with, well, how do I do testing? What's the methodology? Well, we've shown here in integrating testing and methodology along with automation. Yeah, there's a lot of big deals here, thanks. Okay. As you can see, I obviously engineered this to end perfectly on, on the top of the hour. <laughs> that's because I'm, I'm from New York and I talk fast. <laughs> any, any, any final, thanks for the questions. They've been really good. Uh, any final questions? Hey, Val, how do we get a hold of you if we get, I mean, uh, we'll not lie, though, you got the interesting questions for the really nerdy bits, people that have been known to do the actual physical, physical engineering of the hardware, too. So how do we get a, how do we talk to you if we want to get super neat, nerdy about any of this? Well, have you sent out this link? I will send it out in our Slack in okay. a minute. So that, that, that will lead you to... The API logic server at the top. So this is API logic server on GitHub. It has instructions on how to install it. And there's instructions on how to contact me. Are there any issues you would like someone? I know there's a lot of people with, you know, retired that are kind of nerdy that would like to write code. Is there any anything, any features you want added to this? That's a very interesting question. Uh, How can I don't we know. So it is it is open source, and on on every tenth time I try it, I can actually use Git and actually manage to do a Git pull. So if if you want to contribute stuff, um, contact me and we'll we'll talk about um, things to do. The the fellow I'm working with, I don't know if he had a chance to make the meeting or not. Thomas, are you on? I should give credit where credit is due. Thomas Pollet uh, is the guy that coded a, a very large portion of this stuff, and particularly the API and the UI bits. Um, and he, he lives in um, Luxembourg, uh, Belgium. Um, he, so there's, there's both his code and my code running around this thing. So I got ideas for both. And uh, my point is some of the changes you might like to make will be things I can pull in, some of the changes you, you might like to make with things he will pull in, so. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to go, but I'm gonna just throw out a pitch that my company is looking at um, working with Val to add an extension to support serverless on AWS. Uh, we haven't talked to Val very much about it, so hopefully I'm not surprising him. <laughs> um, but Chalice works a lot like Flask and this has Flask in it. So the hope is that we can figure out a way to create serverless APIs um, for our public API because we're big fans of using uh, AWS Lambda as opposed to paying to run something that's not being used a lot, right? Because we're a tiny little company and we don't have a lot of users yet. Chalice and Flask, I like the, the play. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so have fun with it um if there's any more questions i'm gonna go ahead and turn off no no yeah um any any closing thoughts Val? I, I mean first of all appreciate a lot of the stuff we do is kind of like methodology and thank you for bringing it back to the nerd level which i enjoy which is yeah. you know <laughs> the, the engine behind code right yeah. So I appreciate you coming, Val, and uh, love to have you back in the future. Um, anything else you want to add? No. Um, you know, the, it's a it's an open source project, and the, the point of it is to uh, give you guys value. So take it for a spin. Um, I don't know how many of you are using Python. I I started with Python literally two years ago because of the damn pandemic. Pardon my French. Um, and uh, if you've been looking to get into Python, this might be a a nice, easy, painless pain this way. Wonderful. Awesome. I'm going to turn off the recording here and uh, thanks. We'll hang out like normal and uh, for comments. I do have a 14 month old that wants to go to the pools here shortly. So I might hand it, hand off the beer session to someone else. Okay.
but uh where are you at? Yeah. Uh I am in uh Navari Beach. It's a little island off of Navarre, Florida. That's the and, latitude uh, yep. and longitude on the back. I was wondering what sure yeah, you'd like yeah, to know yeah. exactly where I am. Posting somewhere in the Gulf. <laughs> can you show us a copy of today's newspaper just so we can be sure? <laughs> No, awesome. No, Vel. So our our little meetup here started, and we 